Um, at this point now, we're almost at the end, and what I think we get people to do is some standing movement tests. Because all this stuff is in a very small, condensed bubble, right? I still want to see how they interact with movement, and I need to find those components out. And I would do that out of a standing profile, okay? So if I'm standing here, I want to first look at their ability to create movements to their upper body. Okay, so I'll get you to do that, make sure you're kind of in the shot, maybe back up a bit. Good, okay? And you're gonna follow my lead. Now to save time with them, typically speaking, I'm not gonna have them uh, get in what they feel uncomfortable with or their bad posture. I'm gonna get them in the right posture because again, I'm teaching them these strategies, okay? And that's when you expose the limitations. So what I would do is tell them to get in that position, knees out, pelvis underneath the shoulder blade, and then I show them the pattern that we're looking Okay, so the first one would just be overhead. Good. And what we're hoping for is they do it in the end. So there's not a lot of shift. Okay, they're able to keep the same position as they lift their legs, or sorry, their arms. They don't have to compensate at some point. And they can get behind their head. What are you typically going to see? Irritation. What compensation? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so those are things you look at. Next one you're going to grab. I call this the rainbow. I'll get you to do this. What I'm going to do is place my hand in the small, or sorry, the top part of their scapula, right in that area. And when I go to lift the arms, I'm going to see how their scapula is activated. So go ahead and lift the arms there. What should happen, like it's happening in my buddy Carlos here, is as he gets to a certain point about here, the scapula needs to wrap around at the the shoulder blades need to wrap around the rib cage, okay? But at some point, about like shoulder level, a little bit higher, what it needs to start doing is reattaching itself down the center of that trapezius area that we talked about earlier. It's imperative that that happens because when they have higher positions, they're farther away from their midpoint. And if you're doing any type of overhead pressing and they have to compensate and there's no stability there, imagine the risk. Are they gonna be at risk for bigger shoulder injuries? other stuff yeah okay and what that'll typically score like is they'll cheat they'll do this they'll do this okay and you'll feel it you'll place your hands in this their scapula and it'll just keep winging out like myself like I have limitations and my stuff just wings out okay so again I don't want to design programs that are gonna lead into those problems so I wouldn't give them a bunch of overhead pressing first one of the things we talked about was the ability to understand how to keep it stable so I would do that first in my program. Listen to anything he says, it's all alive. Okay. So what I could also do is look at external rotation. And again, I'm going to get them organized in that position. So go ahead and do that. Good. Yeah. Now with some of the limitations, what do you think you're mostly going to see? Somebody's going to be limited and things are going to change. Okay? And if they're like myself or they're stuck, again, I'm not going to do a lot of pressing or overhead pressing because it's going to lead into the problem. I want to get them better then. We need to be athletes to propel ourselves at will and be able to explode. Okay? I'm not going to get that by introducing those areas that make me tighter and then I need to commit to bigger explosive movement. So I don't want to design that yet. i got to address it. So I would look at that first. Okay? Some of the other movements, just to save some time here, would be here. I'm up here and we're looking at rotation. And again, we're looking at how the body is interacting or committing to that, okay? And then what I could look at is here as well, and then finally here. And with limitations, you make those, those test results, findings, you tell them, okay, well, you have limitations here. Let's work on creating that space. And they'll usually score very similar to what they did earlier. Right, if they have limitations here, they're going to score it the same way when they're standing. Okay, so that at that point I say, okay, we need to address the tightness first. That's goal. I have a system set in place to help you with that. Okay, now we talk about one leg balance. And this is what we talked about earlier. The inability to create proper association or activation in an external bias limits my one leg balance. And again, all the movements we do is one leg, running, changing direction, blah, blah, blah. So I want to teach them how to actually garner proper one leg balance. And this isn't just the one leg balance that the hip test. It's the ability to see how much range of motion you get from the hips. 
but I'll teach them to get into the right position where I'm using that postural alignment and I'm just simply shifting a bit more, as opposed to having this, my feet turn out and all that jazz. From here, I'm getting them to tuck their pelvis, shoulder blades back, and they're gonna lift their leg up as high as they can. Try that. What we're looking for, like he does, is when I drive the leg, I don't shift and tuck this underneath, and I don't have limitations. I should be able to get 110. Okay? Good, take a break. That's linear. Things happen at all different angles. So I can't just test that, right? I would do both sides, we'll save time. So what I want to also look at is here. Go ahead and drive the leg to the side. What I'm looking for when they're doing this, as they're doing the test, you can let it down and just get them there, okay? How do they interact? Do they switch, okay? Are they able to align themselves back in the same position? Do they bring that leg closer? Those are things you want to look at. Because when they move more dynamically, they'll show that, right? They won't have the control. A soccer player has no balance and stuff. When they get the ball, they're going to be off center. Whereas if they can control that, they can capture the ball and bring it right back, okay? Then we want to try transition. So if I was here, I'm here. Good. Same on the other side, right? Good. And he did the double transition. Typically speaking, I get people to double, okay? So they go up over. And from those tests, if they have limitations or they have balance problems, right? They'll show it, okay? They'll be like, whoa, whoa, that was crazy. A lot of that's gonna be because of the tightness. If I don't have freedom of that space, at some point those muscles turn off and my body reacts. So that's what this is about. I'm looking at their range of motion and if they have limitations, it's typically because of tightness and weakness, a little bit of both, okay? And they actually can intertwine with one another. If I have tightness, I don't typically have a lot of strength because it's either too tight because it's, it's literally weak or it's exhausting. And that's what this is about, having the ability to recover. Okay, and I won't get that unless I test these components, right? And I'm working on looking at those limitations. And I've already done the other test to expose maybe some of the tightness, so they'll score badly. Putting together my theory. Okay? Cool. Alright. Probably have time for one more. Okay, this one's super important. Lock it down.